I am a great believer that we can't let health and safety take over. I believe that we've got to continue to push boundaries. You know, in 1969, we've put two blokes on the moon. Um, th that was not without risk. It was about pushing those boundaries. But behind Aldrin and Armstrong were a team of 400,000 making sure yes. that everything yes. stayed on track. And they all had a responsibility. Now, take that into a, a micro level. We can do that for, if we can do it to put two blokes on the moon, we can do it for anything. That's Lloyd Figgins, up next on the All Things Risk podcast. We're back. Welcome back to the All Things Risk podcast. My name is Ben Catanio. I'm your host. This is my show. It is what I consider to be the best long form podcast on risk and uncertainty that you will find. We cover risk across just about any topic that you can think of. And we've got a great episode for you. But before we get into it, it is brought to you by Audible the home for audiobooks. And as a listener to the podcast, you can get yourself a free 30-day trial to Audible, which includes a free audiobook that is yours to keep no matter what. Choose from over 180,000 titles, get something for your iPhone, Android, or Kindle. Simply go to audibletrial.com forward slash all things risk. That's if you live in the United States. And if you're here in the UK, go to the link in the show notes, which is on all things risk dot co dot uk that's dot co dot uk right let's get into it shall we this one is about travel and the foundations of what it takes to push the boundaries of travel and without question travel is awesome we can and should explore this amazing world and everything that it has to offer, but we should also do that safely and intelligently, particularly for certain types of travel. And that's what we talk about today. My guest is Lloyd Figgins. Lloyd is a travel risk expert, author, and speaker. He is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society here in London. He is a respected authority on travel risk and crisis management. He makes regular appearances on the likes of the BBC, ITV, Sky News, and other media outlets. And he's led expeditions to some of the most dangerous parts of the world, including the jungles of Colombia at the height of the civil war in that country. He helped evacuate clients during a coup in Madagascar. And as you will hear, he faced a direct threat to his own life a few years back in Syria. Lloyd is also an adventurer, including a 2012 two-person row across the Atlantic Ocean in a plywood boat. This episode, however, focuses on Lloyd's book, The Travel Survival Guide, Get Smart, Stay Safe, which is basically a handbook for anyone planning an overseas trip, and that could be for business, adventure, study, tourism, what have you. It's loaded with very practical advice on everything from transport safety, natural disasters, medical issues, crime, terrorism, and loads more. We get into all of that, and as you'll hear, Lloyd believes in taking the measures he recommends not to detract from travel experiences, but to push the boundaries and enhance them. And if you want any confirmation of that, the foreword of the book was written by Sir Ranulph Fiennes, the world's greatest living explorer. This was a very interesting and practical conversation that I'm sure you will enjoy. We did record it in the corner of a restaurant, so just to let you know. However, the sound comes out quite well. So folks, let's get into it. Here is Lloyd Thickens. Lloyd, welcome to the All Things Risk podcast. Pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you very much for having me. So we're going to talk about travel and your wonderful book, The Travel Survival Guide. And it comes from a very interesting place and background. Before we get into all of that, I want to have my listeners understand who you are and what you do and all of that great stuff. So when you get asked at cocktail parties, if you go to cocktail parties, I don't, but when you get asked that, that question, what, what do you do? What's your, what's your response? You know, it, it's an interesting one because 
you know, the, the marketeers and the sales people will, will tell you that, you know, you need to have an elevator pitch. And for years, I, I, I tried to explain to people that I was in risk management. And, you know, it's such a wide and varied field, risk management. And, uh, you know, they would say, well, are you in insurance? Or, you know, what type of risk management are you in? And I found myself getting tied in knots almost as to what it was I actually did. Um, and I was, I don't go to cocktail parties, but actually I was at a party one, one evening and it wasn't going particularly well and someone said to me, what do you do? Uh, and I rather flippantly said, I keep people safe. Um, and I think that really does encapsulate it in a very brief sentence, what I do. So, you know, my background is both in the police and in the military, but I also worked as an expedition leader. So I've, I've led expeditions, over 30 expeditions around the world. Um, and all of these things have involved an element of risk and keeping people safe. So, um, you know, that's what I've been doing. And then since then, I've made a, a business out of it. Um, and I've worked across a number of industry sectors from oil and gas to mining through to mm. smaller NGOs down to individuals, you know, conducting mm -hmm. their own scientific research expeditions. So, so when you say expeditions, it's, it could be anything. It could, yeah. So I've worked with a number of um, organizations who are doing scientific research of conservation purposes, as well as working with major oil and gas companies mm -hmm. who are, you know, researching or uh, exploring new places to, 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 to mine minerals from. So, uh, but all of which contain a, an element of risk. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's how you manage that risk in order to keep people safe so that they can do their, their work safely. Great. So that's, that's pretty interesting stuff, and we're, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail because travel is so fascinating, but travel is changing. Uh, people are traveling for different purposes nowadays, I think, but maybe we'll put a kind of a pin in that one and, and, and revisit that. I'd like to, however, get into your the origin story of how you got into doing all of this and you talk about some of that in your in your book growing up as a, as a child in all these different places and taking on uh, maybe ha or maybe having a different attitude towards risk than you do now well, so that would be interesting to just hear about I, I, I was I was fortunate in many respects and unfortunate in others that I had a brother who was an exceptional older brother who was exceptionally mm -hmm. curious um, and when I was born and came into the family, he, he, he clearly saw me as being able to satisfy some of those curiosities that he had, the sort of the what ifs. Um, and so he, the, my brother Mike um, would always challenge me to do things that he perhaps wasn't prepared to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that involved things like, you know, encouraging me to go into a crocodile enclosure in a zoo, <laughs> in a zoo um, which very nearly saw the end of me at just two years old. Mm -hmm. um, but Mike was really good at, at, at pushing me. Um, and getting me to actually understand, you know, risk, usually mm. through accident. Um, but hey, that's how we learn. You know, mm. no one is actually born mm. as a good risk mitigator. Mm. You know, no human being. We learn through, through our mistakes, through accidents and so on. Um, and so I, I was very lucky that, you know, I came from a military family. And, you know, and we, you lived all over the world, didn't we you? We did live mm. all over the world. And, you know, so I was exposed to, to the mm. situations that most kids, you know, who mm. were growing up in just one, one country uh, weren't exposed to. So, yeah, that, that came quite early on in life. But it was great because my parents were really, really good at encouraging both myself and my brother to go out and, and, and push the boundaries and, and to explore. Um, and, you know, they still encourage me to do that even to this day. I think my mum gets a little bit worried about some of the places that I get sent to. But generally, they said, live life to the full. I think one of the problems with that is my definition of full might have been somewhat different <laughs> to theirs. What was perhaps, or do you have a, a favourite or a memorable country or time growing up that you that you particularly took took with you or some of the countries you I, I think you growing up mm -hmm. in uh, in Cyprus during the 1970s um, would, would, was wonderful you know the, the tensions were still there between the, 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 the you know the, the north and the island and the south but um, you know being in a military family at those times was very very exciting and I think that that was sort of at the age you know where I was sort of 9, 10, 11 years old where you really could actually go out and push those boundaries you didn't really 
really need that parental supervision anymore. Um, so I would often go off, uh, you know, days at a time into what they refer to as the bondu um, and having my own little adventures and sometimes that was with my brother and sometimes it was quite literally on my own mm. and so long as I was back for tea then <laughs> then that was all fine by my parents as well and I would regale them with some of the adventures that I'd had. Very cool. So what led you into the, the, the military and law enforcement? Was it some, some of it was your upbringing, I, I imagine, that uh, you... Yeah, the yeah. upbringing was a lot to do with it, to be honest with you. And because we did travel a lot as a, as a family, I was sent to boarding school at the age of nine, um, and then I left there at 16. And I do think that there's, there's a part of that where you become slightly institutionalized, either because I was brought up into the military, I was born into the military, I then went to a boarding school, which was a, another institution, if you like, um, where, again, I pushed the boundaries as, as much as I could, much to my own detriment sometimes. But um, it, in, a, in a bizarre way, the, uh, the boarding school environment did encourage you to push those boundaries. And yes, there were ramifications if you got caught doing things wrong, but again, Again, that actually taught you to mitigate risk. It's not to say that you wouldn't do the things that were naughty or not allowed. You just learn how not to get caught. And I think that that, that was a very basic um, introduction as well is to, to, to how you manage risk. The risk could be, in those days, corporal punishment still existed. So if, if I was caught doing something wrong, I got caned. Yeah. Um, and in the early days, I got caned a lot. Um, <laughs> but... As I went through my seven years at the boarding school, I learned not to be less naughty, but not to get caught. And that in itself was, was, right. was a form of risk mitigation. And so then when I left school, it, it almost seemed quite natural to go into you know a, another establishment if you like and I think I kind of like the discipline the camaraderie that surrounds things like the military and uh, and the police um, and I think that that actually gives you you know a sense of worth a sense of being but it, you also learn from other people as well and, and and I think one of the things within risk management is that when you're managing risks particularly in the higher risk levels you need to be able to rely on the people around you and I think the police the military and those sorts of organizations organizations that give you that um, and, uh, and therefore I think it's a, an excellent grounding. Mm -hmm. Did you see any combat? No, I, no. I was a peacetime soldier so mm -hmm. um, I, I got out before the Iraq and the Afghanistan wars um, started um, but I have nothing but utter respect for mm -hmm. those soldiers you know who did mm -hmm. answer the call and, and, and go and fight in those campaigns um, and I, I do everything I can to support those people even now that they, they've come back. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of my, my friends and uh, pe people I work with come from those backgrounds. And I think, but it, it, it's all sort of rests in this, in this grounding that you get, uh, whether you see combat or not. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously a you know, very interesting background. And I've worked with ex-military people across different parts of my, my career, and, and certainly on the on the security side and the travel side um, there's there's a lot of great thinking and skills and capabilities that can come into uh, mm. into an organization I'm, I'm curious what then led you to talk about or provide advice around travel and, and travel risk management it's, a, it's an interesting one because after I, I left the military, one, one thing that the military does is it gives you a, a great skill set. Uh, the other thing it allows you to do is to get a, a whole load of qualifications. Mm -hmm. So I uh, qualified as a, as a mountain leader whilst I was okay. in, the, in the military. Um, and within that came a whole load of other skills, you know, from advanced map reading through to survival and so on. Um, and when when I left, one of the things that I loved doing, even you know, as from a small child, was traveling. Um, and so I realized that travel itself is actually a really expensive hobby. It uh, is, it uh, is. Yeah. And so I was coming back from a trip in Southeast Asia, mm. um, and I was with a, with a good friend of mine, and um, we were really quite depressed that we were having to, to you know, leave our travels and go back to, to normality. Mm. Uh, and I said, there's got to be a way that you get paid to do these things. And um, so I went back to work and the, one of the chaps that I was working with had a, a, a newspaper um, and it was a very small ad in this and it was just 
advertising for expedition leaders mm. um, and he said to me boss you know here's here's something for you uh, so I, I then applied uh, found out that I had all the right qualifications that I'd gained in the military uh, and uh, then found myself leading expeditions all over the world and getting paid for it, which was the key Bonus, thing. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, travel incites adventures. You know, yes. you, you have these little scrapes, you know, near misses, yeah. and so on. But it also teaches you to prepare properly, and that's my you know my biggest thing with with any form of risk management is that preparation, that training, making sure you've got everything in place, and mm-hmm. then contingency for if things mm-hmm. do go wrong. So th- these types of expeditions were across the across the board, across, companies, yeah. scientists, so all sort companies, of scientists, mm-hmm. personal development, mm-hmm. you know, all right. sorts of different different ideas. The, the one you know, and, and even down to tourism, mm-hmm. where people you know leading trips for people who were. Mm-hmm. Going Going to you know weird and wonderful places across you know mm-hmm. varying degrees of difficulty, but I used to tend to go for for the more difficult sure. ones. I used to like the the trekking elements, the camping yeah, elements, I can see that. and all that sort of I, stuff. I was going to ask you what what is it about travel that you that you enjoy? And you know, some people like to go and you know see the sights, and it's a bucket list thing. And mm. you know, if we're in if we're in uh, London, then of course we've got to visit, you know, we have to see the outside of Buckingham Palace and the changing of the guards and the Tower of London and blah, blah, blah. Um, but others, and I'm more in this camp, I like to spend a little bit of time in the place and get to know the people and the environment and this this kind of thing. And, and it sounds like you, you like the... The, I don't know the is it the the rugged or the off perhaps off the beaten track type of stuff. For me, travel is education. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I I don't think there's any better way to educate yourself than to go traveling um, and to immerse yourself in the culture, in the environment, as you say. Get to know the people. Get to know how that country or that region actually works. What is the economy? Um, you know, how do they actually make a living? Um, and why, oh, why is it the people that have the least are the happiest people on this planet? And I've seen that time and time again in some really, really remote parts of the world, halfway up a mountain where there's this tiny community um, who basically subsist on subsistence farmers. But they are incredibly happy. The children are incredibly happy. They have none of the trappings of you know, the modern world, and that's perhaps why they are so happy. And I do think that you can learn a huge amount from actually spending time with those people, and it's also exceptionally grounding. Um, and seeing the way that they, they solve problems. You know, we tend to try and do things with technology and using you know, weird and wonderful gadgets, and yet they use the most simplistic things in order to solve similar th- things. And I always remember being in the Andes and um, going through this village, and, and a young girl came, came out, and she, she was crying, she was screaming, she had blood pouring down her head. Um, and what had happened is she had run out because she had heard that there were gringos in the area and she, she didn't get to see gringos that often. Uh, and uh, she came running out and the, the door lintel um, that she had come out was actually the door lintel to where they kept the animals. And there was a nail um, in the top of this, this lintel which basically went from you know the top of her skull all the way to the back of her head and, and, and tore this, this, this big gash down it. And there I am as as a as a medic uh, with all my you know Gucci first aid kit and everything else, and I'm just about to administer first aid to this this, this crying child with blood pouring down her. When her mum comes out, and all she did was to braid her hair across the cut, and so therefore it actually stopped the bleeding, it sealed it, and just using the child's hair. Mm. Now I would never have thought to have mm. done that. And yet this is something that they had been doing, obviously, for years, whenever mm-hmm. they see these things. And it's, it's those sorts of things that you learn that you would never have thought of mm-hmm. unless you'd actually seen it. And you only mm-hmm. get to do that when you're traveling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Can we talk about your theory of lemons and risk management and where that, uh, where that comes from? Because it features in your book a lot and <laughs> yeah so look looking for lemons is is a risk management tool and and in order to understand that you've got to look at life as being a one-armed bandit slot machine uh, and lemons represent hazards 
that unless you do something about that hazard as and when it occurs, the situation is more likely to get worse than it is to get better. And too often we, we, you know, we roll the dice in life and, and, and a lemon drops in and we ignore it. We don't do anything about it. You get two lemons come in and all of a sudden you've just doubled the size of your problem. Three lemons fall in and it's looking pretty bad and if you get that fourth lemon there's often no right. way back. And so really it's about mitigating hazards or risks when they actually occur and the story that, that is in the book um, you know it, it is actually I don't know the origins of that story mm -hmm. that's not something that's something that has been used with, within right. the, the wilderness uh, adventure so community. This is a story of, a, of uh, some canoeists or some that's right, that go out British Columbia. in British Columbia and they 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 perish because they what the four lemons were they so the four lemons were they were they were novices mm. they they mm. weren't very experienced um, they weren't wearing uh, personal flotation devices um, they were out in the middle of the lake uh, and then the wind got up mm -hmm. um, and sadly they capsized and and drowned right. um, but the, the the warning signs that came before the wind getting up were the ones that they should have yeah. heeded yeah. and yeah. then done something about it. Yeah. So that lemon story has been used. You know, I know, and in North America it's used a lot, um, mm -hmm. and it's just something that I think is a very easy way of describing risk risk management to people in a way that makes sense to them because. You know, I've been in this game for over 20 years mm -hmm. and I have seen people turn off at the very thought or mention of the word risk or safety. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when we are looking at protecting people, we have got to make it personal to them as to why we're asking them perhaps to do something. Um, and I, I do think that explaining why we're asking so, people to do something or follow a particular procedure is more important than telling them what they have to do. If you explain to someone that they need to put their seatbelt on because if they don't, the likelihood is that, you know, something bad is going to happen to them and you can go into a bit more detail about that, they're far more likely to follow that advice. Mm. Um, and, and the example I give is actually in, in um, if you t even take a, a minibus or, you know, a, a, a bigger vehicle, you often, when I was leading expeditions, you, you would get people saying, well, I don't like to wear a seatbelt, mm. um, and it's my choice. You know, if I, if right. I get injured as a result, that's my choice. Mm. And my response to that is always, well, I'm afraid it's not your choice, because let's just say that person weighed 75 kgs. Right. If that bus is traveling at uh, 50 kilometers an hour, um, and then it hits something, Everything inside it is still traveling at 50 kilometers an hour, including that person who is not secured in that weighs 75 kilos. Well, that is 75 kilos traveling at 50 kilometers an hour. Whatever that hits, it's going to do a huge it's amount of damage. damage. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, when you explain that to people as to why they need to put their seatbelt mm -hmm. on, they usually buy into that. And, and I've also found that, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of peer pressure that comes right. in. And even if, they, because even if they, they don't fly into somebody else, they, if they do get hurt, then you've, they've, trip's got to stop, they've got to get treatment, it, you know. Exactly. It's expensive, it holds everybody else up, it, you know. Yeah. Incident you know. management mm. is a lot more expensive and time consuming mm. and troublesome than um, simple prevention than yeah. prevention mm. and and I think the more people that understand that then the safer the world actually becomes but we've got to be able to explain why it's got to be uh, there's got to be something in it for people people only do something if there's something in it for them so um, uh, that's that's how I like when I when I provide training is, is to explain those things and actually make risk everybody's responsibility is not the responsibility of the leader of an expedition or um, you know a work trip or anything else Else, it's actually everybody's responsibility um, and by doing that we can make things a lot safer and continue to push boundaries and this is the key point mm. I am a great believer that we can't let health and safety take over I believe that we've got to continue to push boundaries you know in 1969 we put two blokes on the moon um, th that was not without risk it was about pushing those mm. boundaries but behind Aldrin and Armstrong were a team of 400,000 
making sure yes. that everything yes. stayed on track and they all had a responsibility now take that into a, a micro level we can do that for if we can do it to put two blokes on the moon we can do it for anything absolutely there's a saying that we've I've, I've used I don't know where it comes from it's probably a safety saying around risk which is you know why do cars have brakes so they can go faster yeah. right um, so I, yeah I love that but what I also really enjoy about your your book is that you start off with not just not the kind of uh, low probability high impact terrorism type of mm. risk but just the basics and when people think about traveling to a new destination particularly one that they haven't been before that sounds maybe exotic maybe somewhere somewhere in Asia or Africa or the Middle East some of the, the more extreme scenarios pop up to mind. But actually, the types of things that could go wrong are you know, a medical emergency or getting caught in a natural disaster or something goes wrong as a vehicle safety. These kinds of things, which those are the things that, that stop the car from, from going at speed. Yeah, and, and you know, statistically, if you, if you have a look at what the dangers are when, when you're traveling, first and foremost mm -hmm. is gastrointestinal illness. Mm. Um, and you know, people don't want to talk about no. gastrointestinal yeah. illness because it, it, you know it's it, it's yeah. not very cool no. yeah. when you're traveling. You don't mm. come back and talk to the your, your friends in the pub, you know, about that time you had some mm. gastrointestinal illness. You want to talk about the more exciting mm. things. Um, and then other hazards would be scams. So right. you know, getting mm. scammed, getting robbed, all of those mm. things. You know, they're high. These mm. are the high risk things. And then you come into your vehicles. And according to the World Health Organization, 1.3 million people a year are killed on the world's roads. That's a ridiculous figure, but there's things that we can do about it, and particularly travelers. Because when, they, when we first arrive in a new place, that is when we're at our most vulnerable, because we don't have a baseline of what is normal for that particular place. And it takes us a few days to actually, you know, to, to, to get our feelings about, you know, what is, what is normal here. And the analogy I always use with this is, you know, ask people if they've ever been to, to Rome uh, in Italy, and most people, you know, travelers have said, yeah, I've been to Rome. And I'll, I'll ask, well, what's the driving like in, in Rome? And they'll all say it's absolutely appalling. But after they've been there a few days, they discover that that appalling driving is normal for Rome. They just have to take that little bit of time to get used to it. And the same thing happens when we, when we talk about personal security. We need to make sure that we get that baseline of normal um, whilst we're still vulnerable. And so therefore we need to put in a, a enhanced security procedures around us. Because, you know, as a police officer, a former police officer, I've, I've met a lot of criminals, you know, and I've spoken to them. Uh, and, and they will say, they, they will go for that low-hanging fruit. They will go for the, you know, the people who make themselves targets, basically, where they have, as a criminal, a low chance of getting caught. Um, so they, they're going to look for the people who are unprepared, who haven't done their research, don't have situational awareness, um, because they're easy targets. Mm -hmm. So I always say to people, just you don't have to make yourself, you, you know, harden yourself as a target, you know, just more than the next person, because that's what they're going to do. They're going to go for the, the easy target rather than something that's going to cause them a bit of difficulty. Mm -hmm. And that's something with a few hints and tips that, you know, I've put in the book mm -hmm. that people can do very, very simply. Well, the preparation piece is, is uh, huge now. It's, uh, there's so much available now that we didn't have before. Yeah. Um, I, I was watching, there was a, a YouTube series, and it, this guy was talking about this scam in China, in Tiananmen Square, where uh, somebody, um, usually it's uh, an attractive female, um, befriends a, a male and then takes them to um, a, a, a tea house and, mm. and then the tea is you know extraordinarily expensive and it's a scam and blah 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 and th this guy films it and and you know catches the the girl out and everything and it that wouldn't have existed tw ten years ago. No, but you know it's interesting how risk evolves and particularly travel risk. I mean, it used to be uh, Bangkok was notorious for you know some of the bars that people would go to, 
uh, where they would you know be charged ridiculous sums mm. for a beer and if they didn't pay it then then the heavy guys, the heavy guys come out, yeah um, you know and that and that that um, went on for years and years mm. and years and the advice was always pay for your drink when it arrives mm. and tell them not to open it until you've paid for it and all those sorts of things mm. but now you know it's it's evolving and it, it, it's cyber and mm. that's the big scamming thing now, right. particularly right. for business travellers. So in, in, the, in the old days, if you like, um, you used to get the young, attractive women in bars um, and uh, unassuming businessmen would you know, perhaps take this, this girl back to their room or whatever and then they might get drugged um, and have their wallet and their passport stolen. Well, nowadays the criminals aren't after your wallet and your passport. What they're after is what's on your laptop. Yeah. And it's not a case that they're stealing the laptop. It's what they're putting onto the laptop. Right. Right. So, um, and that's what they want access to. And they want that access to your company information that might be on your business laptop so that they can get loads of information and get right. into your systems. Right. So. When we look at travel risk management and travel safety, we've got to keep up to date with technology. We've got to keep up to date as to what is going to be of value to the criminal fraternity. A passport has a certain amount of value, but it's nothing compared to the data that a business will provide them um, and any identities that might be on there as well. So, you know, the, 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 the risks are changing. They're mm -hmm. definitely evolving. Mm -hmm. Could we talk uh, a little bit about medical emergencies yep. and you, you had a very interesting story um, yourself uh, in in Africa and I, I, this is an area that that I uh, yeah sometimes I do struggle with because in malaria afflicted mm. parts of the world uh, I have also taken this mefloquine which yeah, yeah. you have to you have to take uh, to reduce the, the risk of malaria but the amount of um, of injections and things that you, you sometimes have to take in parts of the world are, you know, just um, mind-boggling. Um, but if you don't, as you've as you've experienced yourself, it, it can be quite quite devastating. So it it, it can be, and uh, you know, the, the the good thing is that some of these things are changing for the better. Yellow mm. fever now is a lifetime yes. injection, whereas it used yes. to be every ten years. Mm. Um, and anti-malarial prophylaxis have uh, have come on since the days of mefloquine. When you know, I had uh, a terrible experience when I was in Southeast Asia on mefloquine. I had hallucinations. I started to feel a little bit depressed. I couldn't sleep properly. And um, I, you know, I had a fellow traveller say to me look you don't need to it. don't take it it you know it, it can have really long lasting effects so i didn't take it i was then sent out to east africa and basically rolled the dice and lost um and contracted malaria um, whilst i was in tanzania um, and malaria is just something that i wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy i mean it's it's really hard to describe what it is like to have malaria uh, for those who haven't had it and you know I, th I think the way that the best way to describe it is imagine the worst genuine flu you've ever had uh, and, and man flu doesn't count um, times that by 10 and you're probably not even close you know it, it's I, I have no idea how long I was without recollection but I, I, I you know I'm so thankful I have no recollection of at least a week of my life when I had malaria because it was so horrendous um, so my advice again would be get professional medical assistance whatever trip you're planning and it could be that with advancements and developments in, in, in medications that it's not that you're having to take more of things but you've, it's about again those preventative precautions that you can take understanding the areas that you're going into because some people will think that you know mosquitoes only bite at dawn or, uh, and, and dusk right. Right. And, and that's true of the Anopheles mosquito which spreads malaria but actually for dengue fever they can bite any time. That bites yeah. at any time of the day. Mm -hmm. So it's a case of making sure that you, you, you have that understanding, you have that knowledge before you go. Mm. And, you know, we're blessed in the, in the age of the Internet that there are so many open source intelligence, mm. um, you know, platforms that you can get all this information mm -hmm. absolutely free, so long as you know where to look for it. Absolutely, yeah. What, uh, what are some, beyond the, the preparatory piece, what, what happens if 
you do come down with something? What, 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 you know, we talked about the preparation, but what happens if you're not feeling well and you're in the middle of rural Thailand or, uh, you know, sub-Saharan Africa somewhere? What, what, yeah, what? I, and, th- and this is where part of your risk management system, you know, whether this is personal travel or whether this is for, for work, is you, you've got to have an emergency response plan. Uh, and part of that has got to be evacuation, and this is where your insurance will tie into that. Um, and I always look at wherever I'm traveling and where is the nearest medical, credible medical facility? How long is it gonna take me to get there? What transportation am I, am I gonna require in order to facilitate that journey? And ultimately, who am I gonna call to get me out of this? Um, and who is going to be able to do that? So, for an example, I wouldn't have my my dear mother on that list because she's all she's going to do is worry about you know. And I I don't want someone who's emotionally attached to me to be the person that I'm going to be you know asking to get me out of the situation. So um, I always make sure my insurance cover is 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 at absolutely top draw and. If I am working in an area, particularly in hostile areas, one of the things I'll always find out is what is the medical assistance, the security assistance that I have available to me, and what are their limitations? Mm -hmm. Because far too often um, you hear companies promising the earth and that they've got X a number number of air assets at your uh, at your disposal should something go wrong, but. My experience of working in in hostile areas is I've never seen a helicopter evacuation outside of a military context. Um, And so usually when something happens, when something goes wrong, whether that's medical or whether it's, you know, something else, um, the first part of that evacuation is always carried out by the people on the ground, the travelers, until they can get up to a place of safety or that might be a medical facility where then the services of external agencies will kick in. Um, but until you get to that point, you're usually relying on yourself and on your team. So it's really important that part of your preparation is making sure that those people are adequately trained and have rehearsed what they're going to do in an emergency situation. And key to that is medical training. Mm-hmm. Um, and that could, depending on where you're operating, that could be a quite a simple first aid course mm-hmm. through to perhaps doing a, a wilderness EMT course mm-hmm. or something like that. But you need to know the skill set of, of, of your group. Mm-hmm. And there's no point having one medically trained person because if they're the person that goes down, who's going to deal with that? Right, yes. And I think it, it's a function of what you're going to be doing. I mean, if you're going to be scuba diving in a remote island, one of the things that scares me is a sea crate, a bite, a bike of a sea snake. And, you know, being some remote island, the anti-venom, you know, forget about it. Um, versus, I don't know, you, you're near a potential conflict zone looking for doing geological samples mm. two very different activities but the scenarios could be and the scenarios could be very different but the procedures you, you, you need to think about those and you need to have something in place and, and again you know ed- education as well mm. about you know looking at looking at those risks but you're right the training has to be commensurate to the activity that mm-hmm. you're undertaking mm-hmm. um, and business meetings in the capital are totally different right yeah so. they, they are but how would you you know nowadays people are very concerned about terrorism you know if if you have a bomb go off or similar to the Paris attacks in 2015 um, how do you account for your your people what tools do you have uh, at your disposal to say that person is safe or that person hasn't been heard from um, and and you've got to look outside of technology for this as well I was in in Moscow in 2010 when the metros were bombed um, and so there was absolute chaos throughout throughout Moscow and one of the things that the the mayor of Moscow did was to go on TV and put out a number that people could call if they were concerned about you know relatives being caught up in this bombing. Um, well, of course, the bombings took place during morning rush hour, mm. so most people in Moscow would have had somebody on a metro yeah. train. Yeah. And so, what actually happened was by the mayor trying to do something good, he ended up collapsing the whole of the telephone network, both the the, the landlines and and, and the mobile networks. So no one could get any information at all. Um, So I was quite lucky in the respect that 
we, you know, obviously knew the bombings had happened. And I managed to get a message back to, to London um, to say that all our team were safe and were accounted for. So that when the next of kin started calling the, the HQ in, in London, they could be told, yes, we've heard from the team, they're safe, um, they're all accounted for, and, and they're sure. in a place of safety. Sure, yeah. That, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's... It, they're they're slightly yeah you know, they are vastly different scenarios but um, but what you outline is is highly sensible. Were there any situations where you found yourself perhaps not well enough prepared that you learned from? I th- I think you learn from every situation even if you even if you are well prepared even if everything worked okay. like clockwork um, and you still learn from it. And it's a case of, it's not just keeping those learnings to yourself, it's about communicating those to others so that should they find themselves in a similar situation, um, they have some advice or some knowledge as as to what to do based on your experience. Um, I think I mention it in the book about, you know, uh, 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 where I was targeted in a grenade attack in in, in Syria. And that, that yeah. I was totally not expecting yeah. that. Could you give us a synopsis of, of that event? So I, I was working for a company in, in the Middle East. So I was based in Beirut, actually. Um, and they were um, looking at operating in different parts of, of, of the region. Uh, and I went to uh, one part of, of Syria. Um, and this, this was at a time where Hezbollah, who were, who were based in, 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 in Lebanon, really, uh, was, was starting to a bit of outreach into into Syria, uh, and I went to a, a cafe that I'd been to a couple of times before in in the evening, uh, and I'd only gone in there to get a kebab. They did the most superb lamb shish kebabs, and um, as soon as I walked into this place, there were two characters in the corner. And it was quite dark. It was it was December time, um, and I remember immediately clocking these characters and thinking, "There's something not right about them." And um, when I walked in, they became very agitated and they called over the owner of the, 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 the cafe uh, and they were pointing at me and speaking very loudly and agitatedly uh, and aggressively. Uh, and I thought, I probably need to get out of here. And, and I said to the owner, look, I don't want to cause you any trouble, so, so I'll leave. He said, no, 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 you, you must sit down, sit down. Uh, he said, there's no problem, there's no problem. Uh, and I always remember one of these characters, he, he, he only had one eye mm. and he didn't have a patch over the eye or anything to disguise this. And, um, uh, and the other guy was huge. When he stood up, he was absolutely massive. And I thought, I really need to get out of this place. Anyway, they eventually turned their attention to me and started shouting at me. I didn't understand what they were saying. Uh, and then they left and the owner ushered them out the door. Uh, and I, I said to the owner, you know, are you sure everything's okay? And he says, yeah, no problem, no problem. And he said, do you want your kebabs? I said, yep, that's what I'm here for. Um, and then he went out into the kitchen and I heard a telephone ring. I remember hearing the telephone ring. And then the next thing, the, the owner came running out uh, and he went to the front of his, his, his cafe and he pulled down this, this big metal shutter, shut the, the, the door, locked it said to me, we've got to go, we've got to go now. Uh, and so I didn't get my kebab. Um, and uh, he took me through the kitchen and the kitchen emptied out into this alleyway. Uh, and he said, come with me, we've got to go, we've got to go. Uh, and so I took his word for it and we started running up this alley. And then behind me, I heard the, a loud explosion um, followed very quickly by a second explosion. Uh, and carried on running up this alley and it, it was only about I, I don't know how far I'd gone when these things happen every time just warps you don't really know you know things go in slow motion things go really fast uh, and I was I suddenly thought hang on a minute I'm following this guy I don't, he, yeah. I don't really know who he mm. is but what I did know is that he was taking me away from these loud explosions which was clearly represented danger so I, I, I followed him, and eventually we got to this this car, um, and it was his, his his cousin or his brother in there, uh, and he then took me to cut a long story short to to his apartment in another part of the town. And again, I'm still thinking: is is this now a kidnapping event? Yeah. Mm. 
Um, and it, bizarrely, when I, when I went into this apartment, it was a scene of absolute normality. There were children, there were, there were women yeah. there, and they were watching the Syrian version of um, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Wow. Uh, and I remember that really clearly. And, and then um, then his, his, his cousin, who was the owner of the hotel I was staying in, um, came over, he brought my possessions and said, well, you, you need to get out of, of, of town, yeah. but you're not gonna, we can't do it now. We need to, to wait until mm. dawn, and we'll we'll take you back to Damascus. Um, so no. I st- I didn't sleep very well that night. No. Um, but uh, yeah, basically they said that the, these these two characters were um, from Hezbollah wow. were looking to flex their, their their muscles. So do you do you chalk that up to just simply being wrong place, wrong time, or was there? Do you think? There was something that you could have done to not have to expose yourself to that. Yeah, two things really. I, I think um, I think there was a bit of wrong place, wrong mm-hmm. time. Um, yes, I could have got out there there, there sooner. Um, and the minute I felt that these right. people were trouble, perhaps I should have mm-hmm. left. But th- th- that's very easy to say in hindsight mm-hmm. after what did happen. Um, but equally, I would say. The, the training that I've gone through, particularly with you know making sure that my skill set, I, I always make sure that I, if I'm operating places like that, that I, I do a hostile environment training course, mm-hmm. um, and and make sure I put myself through mm-hmm. those scenarios, um, and I think that that training in itself actually really helped me. I'd quite literally just come off a course right. um, before I went out to to the Middle East, uh, and I think that that the the fact that you you your level of security personal security is heightened mm-hmm. um, I think allowed you to go yes there's danger over there clearly I need to run um, and you know I, I've got a friend who, who refers to hostile environment training as the running away course mm-hmm. um, because essentially what you're trying to do is put time and distance between you and whatever might cause you harm mm-hmm. so in this case it, you know they threw a couple of grenades at the, at, at, at the cafe um, but another time it could be a, a mugger you know, but what you same things apply. Put time and distance between you and something that will cause you harm. You talk about uh, you just talked there a little bit about your the, the training and, uh, but you've also talked about gut feel as well. Mm. So didn't, something didn't quite feel right. And for an experienced traveler like yourself, you can probably you know work out that yeah, something not right about these two gentlemen. For someone who's not that experienced. Um, you know what? What you know? What might you say? So trust your gut instinct, and everybody has gut instinct. So, so it, mm-hmm. it's part of our our makeup as human mm-hmm. beings. So when you get that that sense that something isn't right, when those hairs on the back of your neck stand mm-hmm. up, um, do something, change something, mm-hmm. change something that is going to make that situation better for you. Um, the problem that we have is we often, as I did in that case, mm. don't listen to it. Mm. Um, and so many times when I was a police officer, uh, when I was interviewing victims of crime, they would often start their statement by saying, something wasn't I right. knew yeah. something wasn't right. Mm. I knew there was something wrong about him. Mm. You know, So we have that, it's, it, and, and we all have that. It's a case of yeah. listening to it and then putting an action in place to avoid the harm and coming to us. There's something about that that we also have lost the ability to uh, to to listen to or to train in ourselves because in our day-to-day lives that we we ignore that well we actually in some ways we should ignore that because you know the the phone going off the our facebook notifications or whatever sometimes signals you know, our brain can't process that this is this is not harm. This is just uh, you know, this is this social media, or this is just I don't know the boss being angry, or this is whatever. But in a travel situation, it's it's different because you you do have potentially your life in your own hands, and therefore you should listen to those things. So it's it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. It, it is, but you know, it, it, you can simplify it by saying look for places of safety. Mm-hmm. So. As you're walking down the street in Madrid or Barcelona or wherever, think about, okay, if someone approached me now and I felt uncomfortable, where would I go? What would I do? Where do I look for help? Now, the obvious thing is to go up to a police officer, but there's not always a police officer around. 
So you then got to start thinking about, well, what other places of safety could I, even if I have to run for them, that are nearby? So your hotel would be a place of safety. But don't forget, a restaurant or a bar might also be a a, a place of safety. Criminals don't want to get caught. Mm. So if you run into, you know, a a place where there's others that might help, that's great. But, you know, one of the... One of the best places that you can run to uh, in, in, in sort of a, uh, an urban environment, if you're out sightseeing, is something like a jewellery store. Mm. Because they have CCTV, mm. they have an alarm system, they often have automatic shutters where they Absolutely. can shut things yes. in. So I, you know, it's thinking about things like that, places of worship as well. Yes. You know, often uh, a priest will protect people or an imam will protect people. So don't necessarily think you've got to get to the police station or sure. the embassy or something like that. Do it right. in small steps. I was on a, uh, a, a confined spaces um, combat training course okay, yeah. uh, very, uh, very some few months ago. And they showed some videos of things. Uh, and one of them was just the difference between, say, a politically motivated kidnap or something versus what you're likely to find, which is sort of petty crime. And uh, the videos were astounding because you have these big, burly criminals. And as soon as say a shopkeeper offered them just the near minimum level of resistance off off he goes because he's you know just risk reward calculation changes and yeah. off off he goes and i think it's it's similar what you talk about uh, in your in your book one of the tips you say if you're lost don't look lost always look like you know where you're yeah. going and then if you are lo- lost you know as you're saying pop into a cafe and just figure it out Versus wandering around, holding a map, looking, you know, looking all over the place. Looking like a target. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. And, and, and it is. It can be as simple as that. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I, even with, if you are confronted by an attacker or would-be attacker, you know, one of the things you need to do is put doubt in their mind um, yes. that, that they're actually going to win that situation. Um, and, and so... It, it's like if you're being followed. Uh, you know, I, I, I've worked with a lot of people who have spent their entire lives working in, in surveillance, counter surveillance, anti surveillance, uh, and, and they all say the same thing. If you think you're being followed, turn around and look at the person that is following you or you think is following you because it creates doubt in their mind. Yes. Uh, and it also creates an awareness with them that you're onto them. So, and, and often people are scared to do that. So it's just knowing those little things that could actually make quite a big difference. Could we maybe talk about um, the uh, so some certain types of travelers? So, so one that I, I had in mind was just women travelers who um, might be um, traveling in parts of the world where uh, women's rights are not 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 as respected as yeah. we might expect in the west or um there are different hazards out there um what what might you just just generally recommend for um, again it goes down to that preparation mm-hmm. so obviously if you are traveling to a country where you're expected to cover up uh, and this goes for men as well you know so there you know there's countries that you wouldn't get away with shorts for an example or parts of countries or uh, religious sites that you have to respect the yes. local culture yes. now I um, think that a lot of this goes down to the preparation side of things. Uh, and I have, I've worked with a number of female colleagues who actually don't think there should be a gender bias um, for, for female travellers. Okay. And that actually if they were to employ sound personal security techniques, by doing so, they are going to reduce their chances of getting mm. caught up in any form of attack provided that, that they've done their research, mm-hmm. that they, they make sure that they conform with local laws. And the same thing would go for the LGBT uh, community as well, where it's a case of doing that research before you go and making sure that you're not going to fall foul of local laws or local co- co- customs or cultures. Um, and what, what we found, and, and one, of, one of my clients is actually a major corporation, have in their travel risk management policy, they refuse point blank to to to, to make uh, exceptions for women or minority groups within their security, the travel security plan, because what they believe is that by doing so, you are marginalising those groups, and actually, if they stick to sound, tried and tested, non-gender specific security techniques 
they don't have incidents anyway. So there is an argument both both sides, but there's there's nothing like being prepared. And if if certain groups do feel vulnerable and they do feel that they need a little bit more training or they're uncomfortable travelling to a particular area, then they need to speak up and they need to verbalise those things and they need to let people know. Because often, particularly with business travellers, it's their travelling companions who are their business colleagues who can actually provide that support for them, who can actually act as a protector to them when they are feeling vulnerable in particular situations. And that could be a social situation as well. And organisations should make that make it possible or make people feel comfortable to be able to do that because like in many areas there might be that sort of tacit pressure to travel somewhere unsafe to make the sale or yeah. to get and, the deal or whatever it is and, and this is a problem i worked uh, for an organization that was very keen to you know do a deal with a with a, uh, a company in the in the middle east uh, and I remember talking to a number of their female staff who said they are not happy traveling to that country. Um, and they, they let me know that I could then let you know, the, the board know that they weren't happy with this. And they would have to think of another way around it because there was no point sending these female employees to a place where they were clearly uncomfortable and felt vulnerable. And so we did. We made those changes and they were able to then, you know, have a work around for that. But equally, you know, um, I remember, you know, talking to somebody who was a, a, a homosexual man who said he was very unhappy going to a country where homosexuality was illegal and punishable by death. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't feel comfortable going there. Uh, and so he spoke about that before he got on that aircraft and so we could put in measures and talk to him about some of the things that he might want to consider in order that he could better mitigate and manage that risk mm-hmm. yeah that's uh, that, that makes a lot of a lot of sense could we talk a little bit uh, I'm, 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 I'm curious around one particular area which is around travel and social media mm. and you know, the travel, the, there's, we talked a little bit about so I'm finding that spot where we put a pin in this, in this topic and uh, I'm curious in, uh, about your, your views. There, there seems to be an increasing trend towards travel for the purposes of getting the perfect Instagram photos, Facebook photos, uh, videos, whatever, whatever it is, mm. as opposed to actually traveling to maybe enjoy the experience or, you know, or, or, or what have you. And I think that poses potentially different hazards and different, you know, different risks. One is, you know, it's potentially less enjoyable to go to some of these places. But secondly, um, you know, if you're taking selfies everywhere, you, you, you know, your, your awareness might not be where it needs to be, or there might be some other, you know, some other things going on that, uh, that I'm, I know you talk a little bit about that in your book, but yeah, I mean, social media mm-hmm. is here to stay, yes. you know, and it will evolve as well. And, and, and new, new trends and new apps will come out and people will use them. But there's, there, there's certain dangers within social media. One of which is, uh, when people post that they're away, whether that's on holiday or a business trip or, you know, they're, they're going on a gap year uh, and they post that, that they're away. And, and what they're actually doing is, is, is letting people back home know that their yeah. house is empty. Mm-hmm. And you might as well stick a big sign outside <laughs> your house saying away yeah. for two weeks. Mm-hmm. And in a survey conducted um, in, in the U.S. prison system, where they interviewed uh, convicted burglars, uh, nearly 80% of them said that social media was their first port of call when deciding which properties to target. Wow. So th- th- that's, that's the, the, the size of the problem. Um, so you're alerting people that you're, you know, uh, away. Even if you're setting your settings to friends only? Or yeah, something. but the yeah. problem is it's what your friends are liking and mm. what your friends are sharing and who they're actually sharing that mm-hmm. with. And so it, it builds a right. picture. And, of course, the career criminal knows exactly how to sure. bypass all of those things. Yeah. Um, but also if you're posting your itinerary online, mm. that also is, yeah, I always is providing that a... To be, I was always told, vary up your itinerary and all of this uh, yeah. type, of, type of thing. Yeah. So, I mean, my advice for social media is, you know, um, take all those great photos, mm-hmm. 
but post them when you get back enjoy mm. the travel for what it is whilst you're there because you're not going to be there forever mm-hmm. um, otherwise it wouldn't be travel you'd be living there mm-hmm. um, but you know enjoy the experience take as many photos as you can and then post them when they come sure. when you get back because they're still going to look great but it's you know there, there are a lot of dangers associated with uh, with social media but um, it, you know and, and on that more people are killed taking selfies than are killed by sharks <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's so, crazy, isn't it? So, you know, I mean, yeah. think of those dangers as well. There was something I came across, which was, I'm not sure if it's called danger tourism or dark tourism, but it's basically this weird kind of tourism where people go to, expressly go to war zones and places where, you know, shit happens basically so that, I, and I don't know what, well, I can kind of understand the motivation and that there's a lot of adrenaline and that it makes you feel alive to be in those kinds of places and we're we're in an increasingly sanitized environment where things are you know safe and protected mm. but um you know i I'm, I, I don't think that these folks are reading your book if i'm <laughs> no and, and there maybe are, they are i don't know maybe you've had some clients like no, that sure, i mean there's uh, an element of travelers who don't you know listen yeah. to government travel advice whether right but government travel advice is you know don't don't go to you know half the countries in the world kind of a thing. well it depends who's, right. who's whose right. advice you actually look at right uh, it does vary government to government right um but you know th- there are people that are going to ignore all the warning signs sure. and these are usually the people that you know co- come home crying when something has gone wrong because you know it, when you're going there's something slightly voyeuristic as well if you're going to war zones or where people have been displaced or where there's refugees or, or yes. so on and and I, I don't really think there's a place for tourism um, in that and if people want to do that then again they need to take the same safety precautions but the more dangerous the place you're going to the more enhanced your personal security needs to be and the security of those around you. Um, and I work with a you know a number of um, hostage negotiators, you know, kidnap experts, and they have you know come across cases and they've had to negotiate cases where people have been kidnapped through their own stupidity, you know, not nothing else, just just pure stupidity. Um, and of course, they're probably not giving too much thought to their friends and their family at home Mm -hmm. who are going to be really worried, worried, concerned and so on. Um, And, you know, I I spoke on on Sky News not long ago Mm -hmm. when, you know, two Brits were kidnapped in the in the DRC. Um, And I worked a lot in the DRC. Mm -hmm. I've I've worked there for for many years. And it is not the sort of place you should be going on holiday. Mm -hmm. It is a war zone. Mm -hmm. Um, And so whatever their reason for being there, it hadn't been researched mm-hmm. because the dangers are are huge mm. and why would you put yourself in unnecessary danger just for the sake of a holiday yes. um, and also create that worry and turmoil for your friends yes. and family back home yes no much much and if anyone is interested in the DRC the DR Congo for my listeners uh, who may not have heard of it maybe think about an NGO or a, you know some other way of getting that experience where you will have all of that exactly kind of security yeah, behind you like exactly preparation and it's, it's that bigger picture yes yeah. Yeah. okay um, I think we've covered a lot of ground I, I do want to uh, you, you, you talked to me about um, at the outset uh, before we started recording about your new uh, initiative um, called trips is that right it's the the trip group the trip group sorry so the the trip group is 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 a phenomenal new thing that we set up last year and i'm the chairman of it and trip stands for travel risk and incident prevention Mm -hmm. so the trip group is made up of like-minded risk management professionals who um are coming together in a non-competitive way, in a collaborative way, to look at some of the challenges of modern travel, whether that's for business, whether it's for pleasure, whether it's a gap year, whether it's for higher education, whether it's for research, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. What we're doing is we're looking, a group uh, a group of us, um, and, and membership you know, is, is open to, to anybody who is in this, in this arena of work, and the whole idea is it's it's a meeting of minds mm-hmm. uh, it's it's a think tank 
think it's a knowledge share. And by bringing in experts from all sorts of different industry sectors, so we have people from, from television, we've mm. got people from conservation organisations, we've got multinational corporations, we've got people from the movies, mm -hmm. uh, and what we're doing, we're discussing what are the hot topics, what are the challenges mm. of travel, oh, cool. tra yeah. travel risk management. Mm. But more to the point, we're coming up with solutions, but mm -hmm. we're doing it in a collaborative way. Mm -hmm. And then it means that members of the trip group can then take that information back to their organizations sure. and say, hey, look, you know, we've been doing it like this for a while. Well, we went to this meeting the other day and we heard from somebody in, in, in this industry and the way that they've actually overcome this challenge is by doing this. And then that can get cascaded through their organization. And the whole idea is that we, we bring together those, the, the, those minds in order that we can make travel safer. For the for the tourist, for the business person, for the for the for, for the, the student, um, in order that we can continue to push those boundaries, that we can go out, we can learn more about the planet, and hopefully do something more to protect it, um, but do it safely. And by getting those people, getting those experts together, um, and people can look it up, the trip tripgroup.com, um, and uh, you know, by the more people who are involved in this, this is becoming a movement. We set it up last November, and already we have over a hundred member organisations all working together to protect travellers. So it's a phenomenal movement, and uh, something I'm very excited to be the chairman of. Um, but it is gaining more and more momentum and, and the whole idea, the whole raison d'etre for this thing existing is to protect people when they travel. Mm -hmm. It's fabulous and I, I agree with you, I think we need more people traveling because we, we need to push those boundaries because there are so many, you know, there's so many ways in which travel, as you say, educates us and allows us to try and fix some of the problems that we've, that we've got, so, but we need to do it safely. So I think that's a great place to wrap it up. Uh, was there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to cover? No, that's absolutely perfect. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. No, thank you. And just, just before we go, uh, where can people find you and the trip group and anything so the, else you wanted to mention? The, 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 the trip thinking. group is the, the trip group, uh, dot com. Uh, You can look me up at lloydfiggins.com uh, and you can buy the travel survival guide on Amazon. There we go. Perfect. Okay, I've put all those links. I'll put all those links in the show notes. Thank you very much, Lloyd. My pleasure. I hope you all enjoyed that and found it useful. And we ought to have Lloyd back, particularly to talk about his row across the Atlantic, which I think would be very interesting to hear more about. So look out for that in the future. Links to Lloyd and his work are, of course, in the show notes. Now, we've got some things brewing, including some more great episodes. If you don't want to miss anything, including our upcoming webinar on decision-making, subscribe to All Things Risk, both the show and our mailing list. Simply go to allthingsrisk.co.uk. That's .co. UK. We are on a temporary one full episode every three week schedule. So we will be back with our next full episode in three weeks. There will be some stuff in between. However, that is it for now. We will speak soon until then. And as always, don't forget, risk is life.